Okay, and we are back. We are back. My guest today is Jack O'Keefe, and we're talking about the Association for Spiritual Integrity. And uh, Jack, just before the break, we were talking about spiritual teacher versus spiritual friend. And um, uh, so I guess we're from one extreme of the spiritual teacher who's on the pedestal and can't be criticized, and so abuse is rampant, to the other extreme of the radical non-duality spiritual teacher who claims to not be a teacher. Um, so how what do you what do you, what do you think about all of that? I think something in the middle is our way forward. Because if some if we go with the model of uh, a friend, we have a boundary problem. Because if you're getting spiritual guidance from somebody, they're not your friend. And like I've certainly screwed up myself in that regard of where I got I mixed the lines between um, where, where, you know, where sometimes where a student felt I was their friend or where, you know, I, there was a teacher student relationship and it evolved into a friendship. And then when the friendship kind of changed or we drifted apart, I was a horrible teacher and I had done all these things. And it's like, but well, we weren't teacher student for years. So the boundary thing is very tricky. It's very tricky. There is a power differential and power is fine. Using it well is the key. Using it respectfully is the key and not abusing it. I think that's where we have to go. Like if you're getting spiritual guidance from somebody and if you're paying them for it, don't give them all your power. Hold on to your own discernment. What they say is useful, maybe, but consider it. Not like they said that, therefore, that's what I must do. That model isn't appropriate because then all the power is given to the teacher and the students doesn't have any power. Now, if we reframe it as the term friend or non-teacher, I think that's rife for more boundary issues. I don't think it gets to the core of the issue. It's not so much in the term of it that's useful, and I can see, you know, teacher, no, I'm a non-teacher. And it's like, hold on now, you still have power. Whatever you call yourself, you still have power. How are you using that power? And do your the people who are coming to you, even if you don't, if you're not a teacher, then they're not students, they're other people. Okay, how do you use the power? Because you do have power in that you're giving something to other people to help them on their path. So there's a power differential. Are you using that power well, or are you in denial of it because I'm not a teacher? That's not an answer either, to be in denial of it, you see? So it's about learning about power, and the right use of power equals ethics. In, in my brain, ethics is the right use of power, you know? And so so acknowledging the, 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 the potency of it, you know, you know, Ray, somebody emailed recently the ASI, saying that um, we were completely off track because a lot of teachers are not human that they are avatars or that they're, they're you know divine incarnates um, and that you know they are beyond all ethics I'm like there it is there, there's the issue you know that perception is so erroneous so erroneous you know because the the humanness is always in the relationship between somebody who's giving guidance and somebody who's listening to it. The humanness is in there and we have to take responsibility for it. And denying any part of our of power it is gives us permission to abuse it. And you don't even have to be an avatar to abuse power. You can you can be a crazy wisdom master. That's right. That's right. That's right authoritarian, you know, believing that the truth is the only truth. It's like, mm, okay, the Christians did that too when they, you know. Um, well, now, one thing though that I wonder about is if you are going to, um, uh, if a spiritual teacher um, can only be friends with people who are not his students and can only be a teacher to people mm -hmm. who are not his friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Good point. 
you have a finite number of people actually who want to who can stand being around you if you yes. are at this place in because i imagine you know you, you like you talk about a, a shift in perception but at, at some point like the there's there's not gonna you, you i i don't think you are able to just like go um um hang out with people who are only interested in drinking beer and mm -hmm. without like pushing some mm -hmm. buttons and then are you their friend or are you their teacher mm -hmm. i mean I, one model that i saw and like i was this this idea of like what was called a one-year seminar where the leader would be like a group encounter a circular type of thing and there was a power differential but the leader was outnumbered by like 10 to 1 and if the people there wanted to call him on his bs they could they could count on support from everyone else like it wasn't going to be like a one-on-one -on -one. it would be like a 10 on one mm -hmm. and so it, and and they were encouraged to like like you know th they looked up to the leader but they still thought of the leader as their friend and he and he tried to think of them as his friend and their the job was to um support each other in growing and mm -hmm. one person might be the the lead you know point yes point person the scout like let's go yeah. this way but yes. the other people in the group were were um encouraged and expected to like challenge when they thought something wasn't right yes okay i understand your model a bit better now yeah so there might be, yeah, I think there might be a problem with it, though. If, uh, you see. Well, it doesn't always work because. Yeah, it doesn't people, always work. It doesn't people work. Yeah. The, the yeah. people that come to the group things are not your clients and your clients are not interested in coming to the group thing. So you mm -hmm. want it with two completely different um, groups. Mm -hmm. And so it's different, you know. It it, it yeah. it's, it's, but it's it's the idea of um, of dealing with the borders by giving the people like the the they support each other in yes. in maintaining, insisting that you maintain your borders. But that means that the the person who's in the leadership role there, it means that they are open to to receiving feedback. Right, yeah. For we sure. don't have teachers that are interested in that. There's there's not a lot in the culture globally who are interested in that. That's the problem. And um, one other thing is that it's interesting around this friend idea. A lot of teachers who abuse their power seriously don't have a circle of friends outside of their students. Mm -hmm that tends to be an issue it's like their needs as a human are not met that they're they never take down take off the mantle of being the spiritual leader they're not in a, a situation of where they don't have the powerful more powerful role they're very uncomfortable with peer support because there would be equality of power so they can't go there it's way too uncomfortable they lose the the skills how to be in a place of where there's total equality but at the same time, they will stand in a position, in a perspective that says, we're all one. We're all one. But I don't have friends that are not my students at the same time. There's a, like an inherent contradiction there that's right. not widely recognized, you know? So, so sure, like, um, yeah. thinking that's of some, some gurus or rabbis even, you know, and it's like, I only mix with my community. I, I, uh, there is no... How do I make friends that are outside of it? And it's like, yeah, yeah. Where do we start there? To, to, are you willing to take off your your hat as a rabbi, your your shawl as a teacher? Are you willing to take it off and be dead ordinary and have ordinary human interactions and conversations? And a lot of us have forgotten those skills, forgotten because you're a teacher for so long you tend to neglect your humanness because the pull to serve is so strong. So, and then of course the dysfunction because our human needs are not being met. Our human needs are not being met. So they're going to come out in a kind of twisted way, you know? 
So like if if a teacher is not charging properly for their work, then their own, you know, their own poverty experience of poverty is going to come in in a twisted way and they're going to manipulate the source of income, which is their students. You see, so so much of it is around denying our own humanness and what we need as people to keep us healthy. And denying that happens a lot in the non-dual sector because we're not people, we're not human, we're not, it's like, hold on now, your human needs are here, are here. And if they're not being addressed by you in some way, you're going to behave badly. That's the reality of it. It's going to happen, you know? And you can, we can, you know, use spiritually bypass and, and use spiritual phrases all the time to, to make it okay to, you know, to say, oh no, when it's right, it comes for me. When it's something wrong, it's the student's issue. You know, that's a typical one. You know, that we, well, let's turn it so that the issue is actually your ego, your problem. You can make anything sound like that, anything. You can really turn the tables on students because, you know, the, the, the text, spiritual teaching text allows for that until the human needs are brought in and seen as, as an essential thing to put in place before we start teaching, before. And a huge new wave um, of problems are arising because teachers are teaching, people are teaching or becoming spiritual friends or becoming spiritual leaders or spiritual coaches. They're doing it too early. They're like, oh, okay, I've got a taste of the truth. Okay, now, now I'm going to teach. Now I can leave my job and teach. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait for five years. Wait, wait for this thing to mature. Organize your life. Take care of your own needs. Do the laundry on your own personality. Watch the own, your own bypassing inside yourself. There is so much more to happen after seeing the truth for a maturation before somebody can even move towards teaching. And the one thing that I, I, I'm always saying is like, never choose to be a teacher. If you have a desire to be a teacher, chuck it out. But if teaching is inevitable and you get grabbed and pushed into that role, okay, now maybe you can be a teacher, you know? Right, right. Um, and so I guess this brings us to um, your, your experience with, um, you know, at first you go into non-duality and then prior to that, so now you're talking about a shift in perception, um, how it's just different ways of looking at the world, different ways of, mm. of mm. looking at uh, you, the world mm. being um, uh, you, other people, your relationships with other people, your relationships with yourself, mm. with the world, and you shift around from whatever perception uh, to from and to whichever perception is the most appropriate in the moment. Mm. Is that the form that your way, your style of, of, of how you understand um, spiritual integrity within the context of your own teaching is to, to um, ask yourself which perceptual model am I is called for here? I think it's yes. I think that structure is very useful. It's 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 about knowing the appropriateness like like it's why we have pg on movies because right. certain material is not appropriate for kids you know right. um and and we need to be wise to to be honest enough with ourselves when we have brutal self-honesty we have a wisdom around what's appropriate where and the, the non-dual layer, you see, once it hits, once that spiritual awakening to the non-dual layer happens and we see that, oh my God, I'm not who I thought I was. There are my thoughts and what I really am, my true nature is, is something within and, and it's, you know, it's full and it's empty and it's exquisite and it's always at peace and it's outside of time and space, etc. And the recognition of your true identity there. Okay, all right, now, it is a shift in perspective. You're, you're, you're viewing yourself and the world from a different place. You're looking from a different position. You're not looking from the survivor. You're not looking from the personal or the impersonal. You're shifting right back. It's for me, it's kind of a, it, it's like stepping back to a wider vista, you know? And so from there then, the, the personal eye 
is more contracted. It's like if they're suffering, the me, myself, I is concerned in it, about its own story, its own survival. And so that me, myself, I is a narrowing of our viewpoint. You see, we can feel the contraction of fear. We're tight when we're stressed, when there's anxiety, we're tight, you see? And so, so the expansion that comes and the relaxed mode of, of the non-dual state is a wider viewpoint. Now, attachment to the non-dual state happens for a lot of people. They get attached to it and that that's the only way to look at anything. It's like, okay, that's not a mature, there's no embodiment there. You haven't brought back in your human body, your human self, your regular life. And so to take time out, it takes about two years is, is what I've seen happen for that non-dual awakening to, to become healthy so that we can now actually function well in the world and know, okay, there's my humanness. I need to take care of my humanness and not override it with, with truth. Do you know, we're able to not have an either, either or, but that both viewpoints show up at the same time. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a spiritual maturity that, that you can bring in and out different lenses of perception according to what's needed in any role. What role are you playing? If you're being, you know, when I visit my mother, yeah, I, I, I play a role of being the daughter. Of course I do. I'm not a spiritual teacher then. You know, so there are these different roles that are asked of us. And when I'm being daughter to my 93 year old mother, I, I, the awareness of truth is, is shining inside as it always is. You know, there's always a recognition of it. I've never forgotten it. Um, I don't need to remember it. It's always there. But me being a conditioned daughter, of course that can still happen. Of course I can still fall into old habits. It's my mother, my goodness. You know, of course she, she I welcome when she can trigger something in me. I'm like, oh, wow, that's still there. Wow, I hadn't seen that before. And so that ongoing growth can only happen when there is an, 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 a, a willingness to use different lenses of perception. Because if I'm the spiritual teacher, talking to my mother, I'm going to miss the triggers that she might still be able to poke in me. You know, I, I miss them because I'm, I'm in this lens of perception. So it's like there is this still awareness within me. And yeah, I'm, I'm in the role of a daughter now. It's like it's organic. Now it's organic. But for a while I had to, I had to work on that to re, rewire my brain to function in the world. I had to work on it, you know, because I was one of those people who completely disconnected from the world and then came back in, you know, and now I don't think people have to do that, as we said earlier. You see? I'm well, not we, sure if that answered your question. I think yeah, I went on a tangent. No, it, 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 yes, it, no, it was a great answer. I'm, I'm, what, what do you mean by um, people don't need to, to leave the world completely and then come back in? Yeah. Um, they just, how do, how do you, what do you mean by that? Because it's yeah. Not, not trying. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's what interests me these days. Um, when I work with my own students, um, how, how to bring their awakening in with meaning into their life and continue being a parent, being a sibling, being a, a professional. How, how, how does that work? Where the rubber hits the road and where a change has to come is if there's a value system in their day job that's completely at odds with the value system that comes from the awakened position. That's when we need to change our life, when the value system is clashing. Other than that, we don't. We don't at all. We can stay with our job or unemployed or being an artist, a bus driver, it doesn't matter what it is, what it is. And I've seen more, as the time goes on, like the last two years maybe, I'm seeing the most exquisite awakening in people who have a job that does not, 
does not um, require them or doesn't doesn't cultivate in them like intellectual conversations or they're just not not open to those areas however the awakening in spite of not being around like-minded people at all awakening will still shine through that's new that's okay. new so they're able to keep going like because uh, i mean i know like like i became basically non-functional for yeah. a while mm -hmm. and i had to learn really i i, I said you came to the realization i, I i've got to like dial this back if i want to like not starve to death <laughs> right and so i had to learn to do that and um and then i have the i have times where like somebody will ask me what they think is a simple question and i'm like thinking on what level do you want this answer because it's like really complicated it's a lot more complicated than you yes. think and i and yes. i just try to figure out how to answer the question and how to function but yes. in the world but you are seem to be saying and is that the difference between sudden and gradual realization if it's gradual you get a chance to keep working your day job while you figure yeah. out what's going on yes and and when when there is a question like that and it's really complicated i i i don't leave the conversation until until the mm, the, the opening the 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 unraveling of what the question was about until that shows up in a practical example in their life. I weave it the whole way through so that it's not simply um, a spiritual insight or a realization, but how does this show up in your life? So I bring it right through, you know, bring it right through, no matter what the insight is, what does that do in your relationships? So, or, or in your job or how you are, what your mood in the morning, normal, normal human stuff. And that's kind of the embody as you go approach that I'm doing now, because the relevance of how it is in regular life is necessary. Otherwise we have the inner world and value system. And then my, my personality is, is got free to be a jerk, to be, you know, to be something that's not woven into with care and consciously into every realization and recognition. Hmm. I then I suppose that's really the the is, is that what we're really talking about when we talk about the spiritual teachers who wind up getting uh, involved in scandals is the, on when they're doing their spiritual teaching it's all beautiful. Yes. because they're coming from a really high place but they've never integrated their personality and their personality just they, is free that's to right. run amok and do whatever it likes that's right i'd never even yeah i just that's I right. thought so they they they've really never embodied humanness no. i'd never thought of that i mean i i mm -hmm. i was thinking it was more like um maybe they were doing it too soon teaching too soon that too they were really ready but it, that it, too and, and and the period of waiting longer would allow for how am I going to take care of myself here? How how what are my needs? You know, how how do I set up structures that support me? Because it's bullshit when teachings say, well, you know, the truth sets you free. Now everything is tickety boo. Everything is fine. That's actually bullshit. No, it's not. It's fine if you're in an organization that takes care of you and you don't have to earn your living anymore. And, you know, but that's not where it's going. It's moving more into the secular world, which is wonderful that that it's it's available and open to all thanks to the Internet and the times we're in. And so we have to integrate our humanness. We don't get to opt out from human living anymore. So, so we've got to modify the teachings so that human needs are part of um, integrating the teachings as we go. Right. right. You know, I, I, I was with Tibetan Buddhism for a while, and one thing mm -hmm. that I noticed was that the lamas had lamas, and those the, the teachers had teachers, and those mm -hmm. teachers had teachers. Now mm -hmm. you're getting to a small group of relatively old men, men mainly, but they they were like friendly with each other and you of course as a student lowly student you're not allowed to overhear the conversation 
but you, I could imagine that they were basically helping one another as colleagues and equals with dealing with, you know, you, you, this is what you should do. Don't do this. That would be wrong. Be careful about this. Watch out for your shadow side, whatever they call, you know, whatever. You see what I'm saying? It was yes. like yes. Um, people, yes. colleagues, co-equals helping yes. each other navigate this. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And so we don't have peer support yet among spiritual leaders. We we have destroyed the, the status that elders in the community deserve. So many of our cultures, I'm not sure where it's like there, but here, like, no, being old is a disadvantage. It's the opposite, you know, like, why not? Why not? Kind of look to elders like who who is minding you who is the teacher so that model is really good how connected were the leaders how how authentic and how much integrity had each um lama as he went up the hierarchy there you know um how much transparency and openness was there so how how would we make sure that that the elders are wise and that they have done their work so there's lots of um, ways where, where we have yet to explore how we could do this with integrity. What would be the best model we could do? You know, and it'll never be perfect because this is the realm of growth and ongoing change and imperfection is the perfection here, you know? Right. But we can do a hell of a lot better than what we're doing at the moment, you know? We're here to learn. We're here to learn. We are. We are. You just recently finished a retreat, I think. Was it an online retreat? I assume. Um, I, 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 I suppose since COVID, it's all online. Um, right. Although next next June, I'm hoping to run a retreat here on Kauai. We'll see. We'll see how, how it goes. <laughs> um, and we're not out of the pandemic yet. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I do. I have a sangha on Sundays. Um, I do a retreat, usually every quarter if I can, um, an online retreat. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of material out there. I spend a lot of my time, though, in the ASI, and that's my challenge, is how do I balance between the two? You know, how much time to give the ASI and, how, and my own work? And sometimes when I put a lot of energy into the ASI, I can feel my own work drifting away. and like, oh, I've got to learn to balance the two, you know? Um, but my heart is in the ASI. It really is, you know. Um, we 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 need to do better. We need to do better, and there's so much we can learn and explore around. How do we set up models that that addressed these things that haven't been looked at in most spiritual traditions? They haven't been looked at ever, you know. Um, and so, one approach that I take is is um, when I discover like oh okay so there was bad practice there all right so what wasn't in place that allowed abuse to happen what wasn't in place and can we can we put that structure in place now so can we fill the gaps you know to build a more robust foundation of what it means to be a spiritual teacher or leader or influencer um, there is an organization that i found recently that is looking at setting up regulation for the self-help but spiritual leadership is in there as well as one of the groups they're looking at so so it's the self-help um sector and they're wanting to put regulations in place to license that and stuff and it's like could we do it without the legislation you know in ireland we're kind of lawbreakers i think it comes from having the english over us for 600 years it's kind of part of my the way I go is like can we can we do it without regulation and licensing because what body would ever really under if they're interested in in legislation and licensing the next thing would be you can go to university to wake up it's like hold on hold on this is an entirely different thing it's an entirely yeah. different thing so so we're learning as we go in terms of what structures would help rather it's not about a top down it's a bottom up approach how can we do better what have we discovered 
that we need as human people? What helped us to integrate? Like, what helped you, Ray, when you were dysfunctional and you had to re relearn? If you look back at that phase of your own awakening, what helped you? What, what helped you to embody and be where you are now? Yeah, that's what we have to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Was it was it key people? Was it books that you read? I'm guessing it maybe it wasn't. It's not really advocated out there because everybody wants the good news, not the down and dirty of doing your own laundry as a human being. You know? Yeah, like what is it that that helps our embodiment? And can we give those gifts to to our students now? So as they're in the awakening process, embody as they go, you know, so that they don't fall into that space that you and I did of being dysfunctional for a while and having to relearn words and language and skills and because your brain changes, you know. I mean, it, it, it. I think if it's being true to the energy, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the energetic contraction goes away and that's like so good that you just want to um, wallow in it almost. Yes. So you yes. Want it to be like, you know, yes. tr true to the energy instead of um, like being honest with yourself and true to the energy. I think that is yes. what helps. And um, when, so when you are offering like um, retreats and sagas, are you, what, what, um, um, you like are you like working with people on um do you make a distinction between like calling them on their bullshit and working with their psychological shadow self or um and doing spiritual work and 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 mm -hmm. getting them to advance spiritually like where's mm -hmm. the line yeah that's a good question <clears throat> and each group is different you know you, you kind of feel into the pulse of of uh the median of the group, I suppose, you know. Right. Um, <clears throat> I I lay it all out because some of the people who work with me would have had a non-dual abiding awakening many years ago and that ground shakes and they're like, there's more. I, d I don't know, but there's more. And I know it's not my mind saying there's more. I know there's more. And it's like, yes, yes, yes. So then people who are not, who, who you know, have glimpses of the non-jewel but can't stabilize in it, what I do is I tell them, hey, hey, the non-jewel will break down too. That is a specific set of teachings, a really good landing place, a place where you've got to integrate, integrate the absence of the contraction. And there is deeper than that. So from the get-go, I tell them, do not imagine that it's one and done, that once once the awakening happens, that the non-dual, capital T truth as they call it, that that is going to be the end of your realizations. It's, it's a nice way station. It's a great way to integrate. It's a certain milestone, but it's certainly not the end. It's not. But the non-dual teachings teach that it's the end. You know? And it's not. It's no. not at all. No, it's not at all. No, no. Um, in tooth, I remember the morning that I woke up in 2012. I was in a, a, a retreat center in Costa Rica at the time. Um, and I woke up in my tent. And I, the first recognition that my mind was seeing was, oh, well, there's, a, there's some kind of attachment to the identity of your true nature as the divine. Ha, huh. okay. Is that really, you know, is, is there some aspect of a concept in that true nature thing? And I went, hmm, the concept of existence is in place. 
concept of existence is in place. But yes, I can feel into it that true nature isn't really a concept because it's a felt sense and it's not created by mind. It's when you leave mind, you taste it, you know? But existence is still there because identity is going to that. So, but I know existence is a concept. I know it is. Where does this going to go? And the bottom fell out of the non dual I'm like, holy moly. Like, so it's much wider and broader than that. So what I do now is I bring people to the non dual knowing that there's a trap door underneath this. Don't hang up your boots yet. You know, there's a trap door underneath this. And so we integrate as we go, integrate as we go. This is my style anyway for now, my change again. Integrate as we go, bring everything into the, the down and dirty of your life. How does this show up in your life? Where are you at odds in your personality with what you know to be the truth inside you? Where are you, where are you not honoring the truth inside you in your life? What would it look like? You know, um, and, and usually it means that emotional reactive reactivity lessens and an emotional response comes up or the need to be understood is fa falls away and the need for approval falls away. And it's like, you know, if your personality really needs approval, then nurture it, do it in a managed way. It's like, oh, there's my need for approval. I can see it. I can hear it. And, and it's beautiful. That's my personality. It's beautiful. And if you can come with compassion on your human needs, instead of denying them, hey, now you're integrating as you go. Now you're, you're taking care of your humanness with love and compassion instead of denying the, those needs, which as sure as eggs are eggs, they will come out, they will leak out through the teachings and come out as a dysfunction and hurt other people. Right, you know? right, right. But, and so you, you talked about, um, just to wrap, we're coming up on the time, my, my time. Um, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit, I guess, about um, your experience. Your experience with like the falling away of practice medita meditation, meditation, uh, because um, I have a similar thing where I'm. I do. I, I. I. I guess my practice is breath work, and um, as I found that. Um, it's like you're doing it all the time in a kind of a general way like you're so like with you you mm -hmm. after the non after the non dual went to the sense of just the sense of existence and be, and prior to that um, i think the the you the meditation kind of like you weren't like you go from meditating hours every day to it's not so you're not doing it as a specific practice anymore because it's kind of just going on all the time mm -hmm. and uh, so how do you see that when um, um, like oh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm kind of like um, You're fine. Not doing well on this question but like, like You're fine. Um, you 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 um, I, you, I, I can you go, go for it. Place, be, you go to this place and then um, the, the, the practice takes you to this place mm -hmm. and then you're in this place and the practice falls mm -hmm. away because mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of like doing the practice 24 seven mm -hmm. without having mm -hmm. to even really try. And now you've gone to an even deeper, further place. Mm -hmm. And so um, what, what do you, um, uh, do you like from time to time want to like come back to the practice just to remind yourself of what it was like or or how does that work out for you yeah i think now um that that there is a pull to practice sometimes um and one place it shows up is i find myself in a deep meditative state when i snorkel and I'm pulled to snorkel a few times a week. Okay. But I know what happens in there. It's like my body is water. I'm in the world of coral and fish and reefs and. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm. It's, I live on an. I live in, on a Caribbean island, and I'm yeah. able to to snorkel very often too. And um, yeah, it's like you go within and you get a nice, calm, peaceful, nurturing yes. thing going. Um, yes. And yeah, you just sort of like, I know that going to the beach is spiritually purifying, but I never, uh, and it's kind of like my spiritual practice, but I yes. never, yeah. Yes. And so like taking care of my body because I'm, I'm very busy. Most people are, I think it's kind of part of the way life is right now. Yeah. Especially. Um, yeah. And the busyness my nervous system needs downtime it needs downtime i've got to take care of it you know and so the nervous system downtime sure i'm viewing from you know a, 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 an outside of all of a place that perspective is 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 um i don't know it's just there all the time and these other roles get played according to what life needs y yet my nervous system can be stressed so my nervous system can be stressed yet there's absolutely stillness here my nervous system is is just friggin busy you know and so to to manage my nervous system it's like gosh meditation used to do that one time so what can i do now and meditation doesn't really calm the nervous system because my body needs more exercise or it needs more water or it, I need to change my breathing or I just need to turn off the computer and go snorkeling. So, so practices that still my body seem to be more important than practices that still my mind. My mind isn't really the issue, you know, because like, it's busy because I'm doing too much, for example. If a day is too, if there's just too many demands and I, you know, stuff is happening. All right, I need to dial down time. That's kind of what I've got to watch. Um, it, just to manage the busyness and to keep resourcing and taking care of my body. I don't really need to manage my mind. Now, having said that, Sometimes I'm like, oh, I want to chant and I pull out the harmonium and I'll chant. Or, you know, there's there's a the two temples here that I go to. One is Buddhist and one is Hindu. And I'm like, hmm, I think I'm going to swing by there today. And I'll dr drive in and I might meditate for an hour. So it comes from an inner urge. Right. But right. a lot of the benefits from meditation long ago are now snorkeling, time at the beach downtime you know sitting with a cup of coffee in the morning out in the balcony do you know like it's like oh well, yeah this this th this would have been meditation time huh but i have different things to take care of now you know and isn't that different the, the ordinariness of enlightenment that's it so there it is to put you on a pedestal put us there it put is ourselves on our pedestal and then there it know, is which allows us to be uh, more yeah. honest, more honest, and more honest with, with ourselves and with our students. That's right. Um, that is right. Yeah. So. Yeah, and you know, the marketing people like, and I've worked with a few business coaches through the years. You know, and they're like, "But what problem are you solving?" I'm like, suffering, mm -hmm. mistaken identity. I'm like, yeah, but. Tell me, you, you've got to name what the issue is and what's going to get better. I'm like, I can't sell awakening. I can't sell it in that way, that it's a that it's a, a solution to a problem. It doesn't quite work like that, you know, because life continues ordinarily. Your response to it is different. But the moment that you package it and sell it, you're creating a desire for it, which is going to push it away. Right. You're, yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're tarnishing realization in some way by making it attractive for the mind. So here we are in this bind of like, how, how do you say what it is? You, you want to share the benefits of it, but it actually will end up 
bringing you to a place of where you're exquisitely human and exquisitely divine at the same time. And your life might remain exactly the same on the outside. Right, right, right. You know, you know, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because so much marketing wants to sell it and, you know, you can you can be enlightened over a weekend or your money back or I mean this kind of stuff is out there. It's like wow, it's amazing, you know. It's becoming a product, um, which of course it's not. It, it, it's not. It's not that kind of product. But we're having we're grappling, we're grappling with it, you know. So so once a calling has started, it's like all right, there is no guarantee. It might take everything. It might take nothing. But let's start with integrating as you go and seeing what happens there. You know right well it, it's um it's like you said earlier it's um you we we shouldn't do it you, you don't do it if you want to you do it if you have no choice yes yeah, so. beautiful um beautiful is there so i've been i've i've put out on uh, i've posted up on the site your website and the uh, website for the uh, association for spiritual integrity i encourage people to take a look at that your mention is the harmonium playing reminded me about your insight timer uh, yes i did i didn't even know until I, your renata contacted me about what, what the interview gave me the links that i asked for for the interview that you played um the harmonium or me or musically inclined i take it you yes. were a cello player at one that's point. right okay. way back that's yes cool. so people can go to insight timer and and you have some musical uh spiritual aids i guess we could say there uh -huh. um jack and and i do i do a live a live gig for a half an hour once a week most weeks um wow. on, on insight timer am. okay well you're braver than i am <laughs> <laughs> oh it's fun it's fun um, inside timer is lovely yeah and, i like um, it and it's free for people truth you know? serum cafe yeah um, that's the sunday gathering yeah sunday gathering. yeah and um so um are your um i've heard recordings of you at live events where mm -hmm. you're like in physically in front of the people and you're yeah. pushing them yeah and then when you're doing it online do you do that as much do you mm -hmm. like you do you really push people i do yeah i do yeah and, the, and transformation happens as a result yeah i i i um yeah um have uh, uh yeah freeing I, ourselves I used, to, I used to have a problem with that until i had someone point out to me that um if you're not uh me being nice doesn't help the other person if you're not willing to if you're not willing to be thought of as a, a hard you're not really helping the other the, the, when it's called for you to push people yeah and i was, and like, I, I was like too nice i didn't want to like really challenge people in a forceful way and then yeah. I was like, it was brought to my attention that that's not really helping, that I'm more concerned about the, how I look there not we go. appearing as a mean person. That's what's going on there. Your yeah. own need for approval, that that was bleeding in there. So, so yeah. you pulled it out, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you so much, yes. Jack, for coming on the program. Um, thank you, Ray, it was fun to chat with you. Uh, yes, it was great fun, great fun, and um, yeah, and if people are into reading, I've written a couple of books. Born to be free. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yes, born. Yes, please uh, get Jack's books. Um, not born. Yeah. What? Bo is it born? To, um, uh, yeah, born to be free don't is. Tell me, don't don't is, tell me. Born. Is, yeah, I'm sorry. Born to be free and how to be a spiritual rebel. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, it. That's right. It. Is it born to be free? Yep, it's born to okay. be free. Okay, born free. I keep wanting to make it the movie yeah. born free. I, yeah. wanted, I think the first time I wrote this up for the when I was posting about the upcoming show, um, I wrote born free. Born free. Yeah. So it's born to be free. Yeah. That was the first book and how to be a spiritual rebel. Yes. Was the second book. That's right. And so. Yeah. Um, there are resources out there too. I've about, about concluded that nobody reads anymore, though. 
Oh, some people just, no, I want to hold a book. I want the physical thing. So uh, it's, a, it's a generational thing, I think. Young people don't seem to want physical books anymore. Yeah. I think they want videos. Mm -hmm. But yeah. anyway, and you also have plenty of videos, and the Association for Spiritual Integrity has plenty of videos. People can yeah. find those on YouTube and on the site. That's right. Um, Namaste. Thank you, Jack, for coming on. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much, Ray. It was lovely to meet you. And, and, um, lovely, yeah. and, and I hope people found it interesting. I, I'm sure they did. Thank you so, so much. Thank uh, you so much, Ray. I will Bless mute you. us and end the broadcast and get us off the air before the uh, some crazy bird lands on your head or something. <laughs> yep, anything can happen. <laughs> okay. Great. Yeah. Okay, everybody, thank you for joining us here on Children of the Sun. Um, we're here every Friday, 1230 to 230 Atlantic Standard, and um, love you all. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ray. That was, Thank that was, you. That was fun. Yeah, yeah, great. Same here. Yeah. I had a great time, too. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, let me get us off the air. Thank you. Perfect. Bye. Bye-bye. And broadcast.